Thanks. I'm going to try and not use the microphone. We'll see if I get hoarse or not. It's great to see so many old friends and new friends. There's a song. Make new friends, but keep the old. But anyway, so we'll find out who that lady is in the course of the talk. We're going to go a mile a minute, so keep, get your seatbelts on. And so everybody likes royalty, right? So the first part is, why should I talk about this topic? It's about royalty, right? And then why about the Qing Dynasty, not the Ming Dynasty? We don't have much left from the Ming Dynasty. This is a poor, bedraggled Ming Dynasty palace costume, whereas we have all kinds of stuff left over from the Qing. And then we don't have much visual material from the Ming Dynasty, but we have lots and lots of stuff from the Qing. And uh, we'll talk about these more. And this brings up the topic. There's going to be an exhibition called Performing Images in Chicago. And I'll show you the details in a second. But anyway, this is also, see the detail? These are embroidery. These are kept in the palace, right? And then this is old stuff, not very interesting. And then this is the stuff we have from the Qing Dynasty. They had huge plays, hundreds of people, and these are numbered. Actually, you have an acquisition number here, but on the back they actually have the number, and you have 20, 30 of the same character, and each have a different uh, face pattern. And these, again, are also from that exhibit it's coming up in Chicago. This was the proposal for the Chicago. Judith Seitlin and her husband, Wu Hong, are curating it. And then February 13th to June 15th, there's going to be a conference in April. And so um, there's also not much in the way of Ming Dynasty palace texts. We have copies of, some of them have uh, costume plots at the end, who wears what and stuff like that, but not very much. For the Qing Dynasty, we have these five color jobs where things are different colors depending on what they are. Stage directions are in red, for instance, right? Wonderful stuff. And I've written a, a brief piece. This actually did not get published, even though it says it got published, because I'm the editor and I let everybody else go first. And then uh, this is the Fan Li, or editorial principles, for one of these five colored editions. And it says exactly what the color coding is all about, right? Got all kinds of fun stuff available for us. Uh, early on, we're talking in uh, 1964, a mess of the Lianta Taiban Shi, or serial plays, were published. And these are very long, 240 scenes of very popular stories, such as The Journey to the West and stuff like that. That stuff's been around a long time. More recently, material from the Nan Fu and the uh, Shanping Chu, the two uh, imperial theater bureaus, have been published. And so we're in a total of, what, uh, 651 uh, volumes there. This is at the end, 700 and some, right? Lots and lots of stuff to read. And these are play scripts, right? There's an example. Uh, some more yet. And then there's another collection that came out that includes also archive material as well as plays. This is the um, table of contents from the beginning at the end, 108 volumes. The last, from 51 on, are all plays. This is an example, reproduced in black and white, unfortunately, as with the first collection. Has an index to the plays. And this stuff you can't read, but it's all about The Last Emperor, Bertolucci's uh, film, right? So there's a lot of stuff having to do with the Qing Dynasty in that film. Now, in terms of scholarship, there's one book on Ming Dynasty Palace Theater, right? And this one book, I won't show you the entire uh, table of contents, repeats itself, right? The first part, it goes through the different reigns, and then it breaks it up topically. And that's the only way they get a decent-sized book, right? There's not that much to write about. Two pictures in the whole thing. And this is the former site of a, pal of a palace theater. It's not extant anymore. And then the second picture is Qing Dynasty, right? <laughs> so not much in terms of way to play with, stuff to play with. We won't go there. This is a list of most Shi Tai Zui. And so the most visited uh, theater in China is a three tiered theater in the Forbidden Palace, uh, Chang Yingge. And then there was a recent exhibition in Macau of stuff that comes out of the theater archives of the palace. The recent book by Ye Xia Qing, who's unfortunately dead now. Uh, a very famous painting that she used of the 13 uh, wonderful actors of the Tongzhu and uh, Guangxu period. I will have a review of that book coming out soon in JAS. And then my, uh, when I'm talking about me, I'm a former uh, flower spirit. And this is what we sang in the Pini Pavilion. Uh, 
and I'm working on a project that uh, Ji Young mentioned. These are different possible titles for the sucker. Uh, and then this is, I might shorten it and just talk about textualization. But anyway, here's some material. So for instance, you want to know the ratio between males and females. Males are blue, females are red. And so this collection of plays was uh, periodically published for 40 different ins uh, installations from 1912 to 1925. And over time, you can see if there's a difference in ratio, males towards females. This is the entire lot, and this is by hundreds of plays. And then this is in terms of naming. Naming is very different. And uh, this is total percentage of uh, folks who get their names and not. And here you can see that the vast majority of folks are males with no names, soldiers and things like that. Uh, over time, this is an important female role. It gets more important as time goes on. People like Mei Lin Fang get very famous. Now, getting back to this person, uh, the performer is uh, Mei Chao Ling, very famous, in an interesting play. And this is a reproduction of a painting. It should be in color, but ain't. And this is, uh, we know this is indeed Mei Chao Ling, right? And these uh, things that are kept in the palace are not named, but it's clearly uh, him, right? Not her, him. And then most famous descendant is the grandson, Mei Lan Fang. This is actually a photo of a, um, that Mei Lan Fang gave to the last emperor, Puyi, who was kept in the palace collection. Poor Puyi only got to see plays once when he got married. Mei Lan Fang performed for him. And this uh, presumably should look similar. This is a good friend of mine, Wen Ru Hua. And so this year, they tried to do a kind of revival of a uh, Qing Dynasty palace style play. Uh, elegant music for an enlightened age. Right? There he is again. And notice that the makeup is ghastly. It looks like a ghost, right? And that's what they liked back then, right? One of them nice and white. There he is in real life down below. Very nice guy. And then this is what it looked like on stage. They have a very reduced orchestra that they put at the back of the stage. Traditional practice. You can see the stage there again. And kind of a funny small um, program they gave out. And this is the kind of stuff they thought they were going to try and do. The English isn't great. Simple, even childlike, blah, blah, blah. But this is the kind of stuff they're trying to do in their um, uh, revival of this play. We try our best to seek roots of Jingju, but it is too hard. It's just tip of iceberg, etc. And then they also had kind of a dictionary for odd phrases, right? I've never seen that before in a Shuo Ming Shu or a program for a play. Now, we're going to go to some history, right? Beginning very early, but going very fast. Look at that. <laughs> okay, Yuan Dynasty, big, right? right? And then Ming Dynasty, not so big. Qing Dynasty, wow, really big, right? <laughs> okay, so these, uh, I'll be referring to emperors by their reign titles, not their personal names or whatever. And so the Guangxu Emperor is the guy who has a reign period of Guangxu. Only one of the emperors in the Ming and Qing had two different reign periods. That's because he got captured in between. Beijing is very important. This is the inner city. This is where the Manchus lived. You could not build theaters in the inner city. And this is the outer city where the Han people lived. And the palace, of course, you know, right, is the smallest, right, the Frin Palace in the middle. These are some good rulers on the top, bad rulers on the bottom. And then this is a bad ruler enjoying himself with spectacle. They're always the bad last rulers. Good rulers do proper stuff. This is actually a play that's rehearsing the founding of the Zhou Dynasty. So this is the uh, last formal emperor of the Ming Dynasty, the Chung Chungjun Emperor. He's a pretty good guy, uh, guy, excuse me. So Li Zicheng, a bandit king, took over Beijing. And then uh, Wu Sangui led him in the pass, right? And then this is a Western picture, of course. And then Chung Zhen killed himself on Coal Hill, out the back door of the palace. This is, there's actually another emperor. There's a Southern Ming that continued. This is the Fu Guang, uh, Hung Wang emperor. And so he looks nice there, but he's up to stuff there, right? <laughs> In fact, more importantly, he was uh, up to plays. He was a shimi, a, a play addict. And so there's a play, uh, Pe Peach Blossom Fan. And there's a scene here. All he cares about is getting a nice play to watch. He doesn't care about the fact that the Manchus are going to and they're going to get him, right? And so in the Ming Dynasty, there are two eunuchs who came out of the entertainment department who became basically eunuch dictators. Liu Jin here uh, in his Peking Opera costume. And then Wei Zhongshan. Wei Zhongshan does not appear in any play that I know of. And this is like a eunuch playing card, I guess, right? This is Wei Zhongshan. 
And so it's not good to have a reputation as a shimi or opera addict, right? This guy is an official, right? And he's an opera addict. This is a uh, oral piece where there's an opera addict. He walks down the street and he's singing, ni dong bu dong bu dong bu dong bu dong ni bong bu dong. And dong means to wait, right? And so the other guy says, well, dong she, right? Who am I waiting for? And so on, stuff like that. And then uh, this is, uh, if we had time, we could listen to a link of it. And then I have been called a shimi myself. So mei wo shimi, lu da wei, right? <laughs> Lu Dawei is my Chinese name, okay? So these are the Qing rain periods, right? And so we'll show you some pictures. Manchus are others, right? They're on Han, not Han, right? And so here's some people. Also, there are a variety of different people who came together to womp the Chinese, right? There weren't Manchus before that happened. They had divided themselves into banners, and then they had their own kind of entertainments. They like big yurts, I guess it is. Horse riding, uh, wrestling. Wrestling is very big, right? And then also Tzajishu, a particular style of oral performance. Okay, so the emperors. This is uh, Nurahachi, and a not-so-flattering por portrait of him. He was the first one to claim himself emperor, Hong Taiji, and his lady, and then the Shunjia emperor, the first one to become emperor of Beijing, although it was really a, uh, a regent, Dorogun, who was running the shop. She's a nice old lady. And then uh, this is Emperor Kangxi, Two very important emperors, Kangxi and Qianlong. Both of them reigned 60 years. And then Qianlong actually stepped down from the throne so he wouldn't surpass his grandfather. A Western picture of him. So lots and lots of pictures. Here's his armor even. Here he is in his study, one of his ladies. And wow, this is very interesting, right? A Western. Uh, and so the Yongzheng emperor, right? A hard, well, hard ass, let's say. Yep. And uh, Qianlong, he's out of, out of rank. I noticed he was in the wrong place. But anyway, Hongshan, so the Qianlong reign is supposed to be the flowering, the flourishing of Chinese culture and prosperity. Hongshan was a, the favorite of the Qianlong emperor. He ended up with half of the, the treasury. And so things went bad after um, uh, Qianlong emperor. And this is uh, Jia Qing, the next one. And then Daoguang, particularly ugly. And so during Daoguang's reign, finances are going down. Qianlong had all the money he wanted to spend on theater. Daoguang cut back. Under Qianlong, you had thousands of people in the opera bureau in the palace. He cut it back to 500 or so. Uh, Shenfeng Emperor uh, got on the throne very young, and it was under his reign that the Second Opium War happened. The French and the uh, English took Beijing, and then, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Shenfeng had to run away to Ruhe, to the different summer palace, and this is the other summer palace that got burnt, the one outside of uh, Beijing. This is Empress Dowager Ci An, okay? And then you have Empress Dowager Ci Xi. Ci An was younger in years, but senior, right? And so Ci Xi, real opera fanatic, but didn't really get to play until uh, Ci An died, 1881. And there's a, uh, excuse me, that was um, Tong Zhu again. Tong, because two regions at the same time, Tong together. And this is uh, Tongzhi again, going the right way. Here's Guangxu, right? Emperor Guangxu in, in his study. And he was locked away because he tried to reform and so she didn't like that, so he got locked away. Some people think that uh, she poisoned him. Here's some foreigners taking over the throne, box of rebellion. And then this talks about, and so so she ruled as a regent behind the curtain. And here it's talking about how women have to watch behind lattices. Uh, theater. And what they're worried about is that folks would flirt, Diao Bangzi, right? This is later uh, Shanghai Theater where the women are upstairs getting into trouble. This is a uh, private performance. Notice that the women are watching behind a screen. Okay? Uh, there's a recent book about uh, Sushi, I haven't read yet, seems to be trying to rehabilitate her. Here's an uh, oil portrait of her by Rebecca Carl. And here she is hanging out with some envoys wives. And then a tinted photograph, lots of eunuchs. Uh, Li Yanying, uh, one of them actually became uh, originally an actor, became the most important guy. Everybody thinks, so she, what did she do? She spent all the naval budget on the stone boat. Actually, before her, the Taiping rebels had their own stone boat in Nanjing. You can go see. And the Taiping rebels, although they said they didn't like theater, had theaters in their palaces. That's one in Suzhou. So here's Su'an again. 
And then after Sarah died, so she could do what she wanted, she had her own troop, her own troop of eunuchs in the palace. And then she also brought in outside performers into the palace, people like Tenshin Bey, the king of opera at the time, when Tenshin Bey's daughter got married. So she gave this silver bowl and inscribed it to um, celebrate the marriage. And then here we have a script. And so she has changed the word Tenzin, emperor, to Shangmu, referring to herself. So no small ego, right? She loved to take pictures. Here she's playing like she's Guan Yin. Then there's a writing about that. There's a show uh, about that. There's also an article about her as a dramaturge. And also, people had this idea that she had love affairs with actors. Yang Yelo actually got into trouble for a different reason. And the idea that uh, Su Xi and uh, her got it on is impossible. But anyway, people thought that that was a fun thing to think about. This is a report about the real court case, Yang Yelo. And this is a Western publication, Venerable Ancestor, that talks about all her affairs, which are not true as far as we know. Okay, and so there's all kinds of movies about Yang Yelo, and they get sillier and sillier, right? So we don't, and so you'll see in those movies, uh, so she late at night lets her hair down and brings in Yang Yelo, and then she wants uh, Yang Yelo to give her instruction on how to do Peking Opera stuff and so forth. Oh yeah. And so here's Pui, right, the last emperor. He was very young when he got on the throne. That's the thing that uh, Mei Lanfang gave him. And these are the regents who looked after him. This is Yuan Zhikai, the military figure who took over the republic after it was founded. He actually wanted to become emperor. He also was an uh, uh, a opera addict. And so back again to Sushi, uh, play acting. She loved to pretend she was uh, Guan Yin. Some of the other uh, emperors were also into play acting. This is Yong Zhang. And there's this series of these paintings he had made of him with all these different kind of poses and personas, right? So probably want to see that again. Huh? There he is. Okay. And notice they had a Western one in there too, right? Having a good time. And so here he is very proper giving a lecture. It's in a long scroll. And this is a guy, some of you might be familiar with Jonathan Spencer's book, Treason by the Book. And so this is a guy who stirred up sedition and Yuan Zhang, instead of cutting his head off, argued with the guy. So it's very different. So here is uh, Kang Xi, I think, no, Chen Long in armor. And then Chen Long tried to uh, portray himself, not once, but many times, as a bodhisattva. And then there's also a famous painting, uh, Sri Isra, and you've got one image of him and another image here. So a lot of play acting. This is Chen Long and his son. Uh, and so the emperors also were involved in performance. So Chen Long wrote a play. It's about a beggar of all things. And then uh, different folks, uh, the Tongzhen Emperor and the Daoguang Emperor, Shenfeng Emperor, uh, like to perform for relatives, not uh, formally. And then these two emperors like to play the drum. The drum is basically the conductor in Peking Opera, very important. So in terms of the uh, institutions of drama uh, in the palace, most important was, is the Nanfu, the early one, that then switched to the Shenping Shu, and then there was a unit in Jingshan, where the emperor uh, killed himself, Jing Shan, back the, out the back door of the palace, and then Nan Fu uh, over here. And then the actors, when they went inside of the palace, had to have Yao Pai, or uh, passes, right? And then this is the theater within the uh, bureau. And then such things, emperors and theater. When emperor died, everybody had to mourn. These are two examples of stories where people are infringing. You're not supposed to uh, make noise or wear red, for instance, or make noise during that period of mourning for the emperor. Uh, this is a statue supposedly of the birth mother of the Jiaqing emperor, who was originally an actress. And so as you might know, males, uh, females were uh, forbidden from the stage after a certain point. Uh, popular stories say that she was an actress. She didn't want any further competition from actresses. This is a ritual play being performed. Uh, ritual plays we don't have much uh, images of. This is quite late. And so the, the uh, theater establishment produced ritual plays for the seasons. This is a set of pictures of the 12 seasons, right? So for um, uh, New Year's, you had to have a New Year's play, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you also had to have special plays for birthdays, wishing long life. These are spectacles, not much plot. And then also the emperors, particularly Chen Long and Kangxi, like to go down south and take tours. So this is a picture from that. 
So in the years, uh, up to the, the Daoguang period, most of the actors were coming from the south. And so like the organization that controlled actors was actually located in the south. Okay? Later it switched to Beijing, to the Jingzhong Miao, which is actually a temple dedicated to Yue Fei, but which also uh, has uh, the god of theater, the Xishan. Doesn't look very auspicious, does he? And then folks had to register. And so this is a registry for one troop, the Tongqing troop. And so all the names of the people in the troop and all the plays they had to perform had to be registered with this governmental organization. After the dynasty fell, it was turned into a newfangled organization. This is a story about the Yongzheng emperor. An actor once asked, well, is this particular post open? And the, actor says, uh, the emperor said, what the hell are you asking that for? And then he executed him, right? So actors were not well received. Also, a literary inquisition in the Qianlong period went very well with texts. And they tried to do it with drama, but it did not work. Drama was too powerful. And then um, in the Qianlong reign, toward the end, early part of Qianlong, you were forbidden to wear Qing Dynasty costume on stage because it's too sensitive. During the Qianlong reign, toward the end, they started to let you wear Qing Dynasty costume. They also started to allow plays that favored the, the Song Dynasty versus the Jin Dynasty. The Manchus thought of themselves as descendants from the, uh, the Urchets from the Jin Dynasty. So a big change happened. And so later on in Peking Opera, this is actually Manchu dress. All ethnic folks from the north wear Manchu dress. Doesn't matter if they're from the Liao. This is actually the Empress Dowager of the Liao Dynasty wearing Manchu dress. And so same figure in modern dress and then imperial uncles and so forth. So here's some, uh, I want to stress two main styles of drama, Kun Chu, which Joseph Lam loves, and then Peking Opera, right? Okay, and so you can figure that out if you had time. But anyway, remember in the south, that's where all the, uh, the, uh, the southern form Kun Chu comes from. And so the emperors like to travel down there. This section I'm gonna uh, do here, we're gonna work from the outside. So where did the emperor see drama outside the palace? So he saw it on his tours of the south. And so the merchants down there actually organized boats to perform plays on boats for the emperor to watch as he was headed back north. Uh, it was common enough for people to watch plays that were performed on stage from boats, but they actually uh, had the, pl the plays performed on boats, right? And so the Qing were northerners, the emperors were northerners, they didn't like that southern dialect stuff. And so they would complain, saying, talk good Chinese, right? And then eventually they liked Peking opera pretty good. So this is a uh, palace text that's described as Lantan, an early name for Peking Opera, okay? And so we start to see performances of Peking Opera in the palace in the, um, excuse me, the Xianfeng reign period. Here's the emperor in Khorhut in uh, Inner Manchu, uh, Inner Mongolia, and he's undercover. And so we have all kinds of stories about the emperors liking to get out and uh, hang out with the people and see drama. So this is a wall painting, also circulated as a uh, woodblock print. So this is an example of a description of celebration of, in this case, Empress Dowager's birthday. They set up in the, in the uh, capital uh, many, many stages. You go from stage to stage to see these performances. Uh, and I did not mention Andrea Golden's book, so that's there. Uh, that was her translation. And so along the street, you could take in all kinds of sights. And so here we have uh, a performance going on here. So a long scroll was made and also copper engravings were made. Okay? And the copper engravings has a lot of details. And a Japanese scholar has gone through them all and tried to figure out what play is being performed. I won't show you the entire article, right? Another thing that happened that up in Ruhe, in the, um, the summer retreat, you would have performances on a three-tiered stage. And so a lot of supernatural stuff, uh, hun uh, over a thousand people supposedly on stage at the same time, demons and animals, elephants and stuff on stage. And then um, there's another example of somebody, this is a Korean envoy who went to go see one of this. This was written by Chinese. This is written by a Korean envoy. And notice here, he says that, I had no idea what it was all about. And then somebody said, oh, there's a program. Look at the program. Okay, and so this is where the uh, retreat is at Rocha. And then what they would do, the Xiao Ting is called this particular style of drama, tributary drama, okay? So you win a victory here in Nanan, for instance, you have a big celebration. 
So very few illustrations of performances uh, on three tier stages at once, right? Lots of people, very military there, they're celebrating the victory. This is where Taiwan, okay? So they got flamethrowers or something. And so when they whomped everybody in Taiwan, and notice they got boats on the stage here, right? And then these also circulated. You can see very clearly the last image, the same. These circulated as prints. So this is the three-tier stage uh, that was at Rojo, and it burnt down. Okay? And so also important, McCartney went to China, right? And he didn't want to cut out, right? And then he got, was given a performance, and he just kind of scratched his head with what was going on. There was a whale spitting water and so forth. And then this is from Ye Xia Ting's book, and she found the script. And then there's a description of what's going on. Actually, what the emperor was saying that, you know, there's this big whale in the sea. When you go home, it might give you trouble. We have taken care of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, McCartney didn't understand, right? He thought, he thought it was a marriage or something or other and something or other, right? And so, um, big event, right? And so this is what the Chinese thought English looked like, right? And then McCartney uh, brought some rifles and clocks and stuff like that. And then the uh, Chenlong Emperor was happy. He made some poems in a nice book. I don't think he gave a copy to McCartney. And this is a script for the play uh, with the whale in it. We don't have a lot of props left over from the uh, Imperial Theater Bureau. And this is a prop you could get in and move it around, right? So maybe the whale was something kind of like that. Somebody has said that, oh, at the same time, well, actually earlier, uh, Europeans were up to the same kind of thing. And there's a different kind of thing like that. And this is a nice fun suit you could wear. And so a lot of supernatural stuff going on in the big place, right? And this is a list of different props that are being moved. We don't have a complete inventory, but we're talking about tens of thousands of props that they had. Now, animals on stage, this guy was famous for bringing one mule on stage, not elephants, right? And so, and then uh, in Peking Opera, you get somebody in a suit. This is a tiger, right? It's really silly. Or here you have a donkey, somebody playing like a donkey, right? Now, uh, this is one of those five color scripts, and you can see that uh, how do they do ghosts? For instance, these people are wearing ghost masks. These people over here are wearing water creature masks, right? So we get a lot of details from the scripts of uh, stagecraft. They did use some masks. The masks tend to be used for supernatural critters. And we also have these face paintings, right? So clearly, they've got a bird there. There's also a technique where you use phosphorus on stage to make fireworks, right? This instance, you've got a ghost who is scaring off a bad guy. And she is, uh, in the play descriptions, it says, some of them says she puts on a ghost mask at this particular point. So they throw the phosphorus to show you that there's supernatural stuff going on. And here it's being used to indicate a fire. There's a fire on this mountain. And then if we had time, we could go to this link and you can see somebody actually do it. But don't have time, sorry. So this is a list of all the stages in the Imperial Palace, right? Lots and lots and lots. And I have underlined, excuse me, I have underlined all the three level jobs, okay? Here's a model of um, one that was in the, that's in the Thumrit Palace, right? Uh, on this list here, you can also see the years that they were uh, built. So the one I just showed you a model of is the last one to be built in the Guangxu reign late 19th century. There's a model. This is Chang'inge, which is in the Forbidden Palace. This is a trap door above. People could descend through. Uh, this is the first level, which had a second level back here. Uh, and you could have the orchestra up there if you wanted. And then this is looking from the back toward where the uh, Empress Dowager would watch, for instance. And this is also where the Empress Dowager would watch. And so those of you who came early, I played a Monkey King play where they're using uh, at least two different levels. So do you think you could see very well what was going on in the top level? No. So you go through the scripts, and the, it's kind of a waste, you know, the, the two floors above. Okay. So a very small one. This one has been refurbished, uh, the uh, Drenchen Jai, a place to get over being tuckered out. And it has Trump loyal paintings all over the place. That's very harsh, but you can see some detail, right? And this is from the stage looking out, okay? And there's all kinds of stuff online about the restoration of that. And they also had smaller stages, which would have a second floor that you could drop people down from. I was talking to somebody, and they had gone to Zheng Yitzhi in Beijing, which is an old theater there, and they recently added a, um, they call them Tianjing, Heavenly Well, uh, a way to descend from up there. So talking about stagecraft, some of the things that, 
you have palace practice, eventually comes out into public practice. The idea of serial plays, remember I said 200 scenes, take a year to do the, the whole thing, right? Became very popular in Shanghai, and these are the reprints of those. This is the guy who wrote a lot of them, Zhang Zhao. He was also the head of one of the six bureaus, right? So a big time guy, and he's writing plays for the emperor. Uh, these don't tend to be performed, right? You can imagine why. And this is a five color version of their version of the Western uh, Journey to the West play. Lots and lots of stage directions, right? All the red. It also indicates what, uh, how the individual scenes are supposed to be sung. The Kun Chu here, some of them are in Yiyang. Uh, Kun Chu and Yiyang are the two favorite styles. And then Peking Opera was kind of the bastard child, which eventually did okay. So that's the first scene. Now, I do not have a picture of it, but also within the palace, they pioneered using lights on stage, lanterns that are lit up. And this is a uh, Shanghai play that's supposed to feature that, but I couldn't find a picture where you could actually see the lights. And of course, you couldn't see a light in the picture anyway. Okay? And so we don't have a lot of imagery of the stagecraft. This is actually Shanghai stuff. So Shanghai theater really went into uh, mechanical scenery. And this is uh, showing how they did waves and people going through the sky. They could lower people up and down, one person, 10, 15 person on the imperial three-tiered stages. You know, different kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> kind of stuff that has remained to us. I could have shown you a scene from The Last Emperor. What happens is a scene in The Last Emperor, the three of them are in bed. Uh, Pui and two consorts, and they're having a good time. And then things light up, the fire is going on outside. Next day they wake up, everything's burnt down. Pui says, you know what? The eunuch set that fire is to cover. They've been stealing stuff and selling it, right? So a lot of stuff originally kept in the palace uh, went outside. And so the kind of stuff, we have chairs, right? Chairs used on stage. And it's funny, and then they're nice looking chairs, but it's a little odd because on stage they're covered up. You wouldn't see all that detail, okay? And so in terms of visual aids that they've got, we have these, um, the examples of these that made it out into the public, they included some words. Chen Dai Zhu Yang Si Ban, mainly saying that for the uh, makeup and uh, what people are wearing and so forth, follow this model. That was added. These are probably just the equivalent of baseball cards that the Empress Dowager liked to play with, right? And no practical purpose. Professional theater people, they don't need that, right? The uh, face patterns for the big plays, you know, you probably have people, uh, they drag off the street to do those. So there's two styles of these things that were kept in the palace. These are half body, right? And then there are also full size ones. These have been published quite well. These are not, they're pretty, uh, pretty rarely seen. And so these are, excuse me, this lot, they tend to be in sets where you have the name of the play in the first one and then made up. 10, 20 sometimes people in the same play. More of these full body jobs. And so these are the ones, these would be for the big plays. And again, uh, let's see, here. We have an annotation over here that you've got 24 demons. This is demon number 21. Mm -hmm. And so when you're doing this play, do this guy according to that, right? And these, you can see the, all these different patterns, right? Somebody's having a good time. And then also kept in the palace, we have what? These are single images of scenes from different plays, right? And there's a lot of them there. This is San Chaco, or the fight of the crossroads. They're always bringing it out for foreigners because there's not much dialogue going on. And notice that the stage is very bare. So it's kind of ironic that most of the material that we have, the visual stuff, is from really the Peking Opera era. Peking Opera era, they didn't go in for all the stage work and um, hundreds of people on stage at the same time. Okay? And so I would like to have, for instance, equivalent uh, paintings for the big tributary dramas, right? They would be very interesting. And so here we have a military, excuse me, a, you can call it a, a wuxi, uh, a martial play is a better idea. Here we have two Judge Baos, right? You have to figure out which is the right Judge Bao. Uh, here we have the Monkey King in a very simplified uh, face pattern here. Okay, those of you who came early, you saw the Monkey King there as well. And then we have Critter, somebody in a Critter suit there. And all of these are the same. They're very nice. They have the name of the play over here. 
Chusan Hai, getting rid of the three scourges, and then you have the names of the individual peoples. Uh, been a little stingy here. And so this is actually a dragon. So one of the scourges that has to be removed is a dragon. You have a guy in a dragon suit. Okay? <laughs> and so, so these are basically the same, or modeled on, a popular prints that are in circulation. Notice the popular print doesn't care about showing the full stage that much. There were some as well, but very simple backgrounds, right? Uh, this is a play that we'll talk about. This is a uh, Silang, fourth son, goes to visit his ma, and this is, he uh, is a, a Song Dynasty general. He gets captured, pretends he's somebody else, and then marries the Liao Dynasty princess. Okay? Very famous play. So there are also figurines. There are people who are very famous for making these kind of figurines, supposed to be very realistic, and these are kept in the palace as well. Now, this is a very interesting project. It's all about theater costume, and there's that same picture again. Notice how white their faces are. So what he does, he compares the Qing Dynasty paintings with, uh, sometimes there are Qing Dynasty costumes, but in this case not, right? The thing that you immediately notice is that all the busy work on the paintings, right? Whether or not that's realistic or not, you, it, at a distance, right, that would just be a mush. It would not work, right? And so this is the theatrically uh, pra more practical. You know? Again, here you have this guy, he'll give you a headache, all that different colors going on, right? And then the, his robe is much simpler, right? And, and this is the robe that a beggar would wear, Fu Guayi. And so the palace style one is very busy going on. And then a commercial uh, popular one is much simpler. So the kind of uh, written documents that we have in the palace that can help you understand what was going on in performance. This is a list of what people are supposed to wear in different plays. And then we also have, this is a, a theater program. And this is also changeable. You could take out the titles of the plays and put other ones in, right? Uh, they kept track of the, this one doesn't have, happen to have an, the time run, uh, the running time for each of the plays. The emperor wanted to know when his favorite play was coming on. And the emperor Thowager, for instance, get pissed. Said, you finished that play already? And make him do it again. This is a backstage uh, outline for a play, goes scene by scene by scene, saying that which characters are there and which actors are going to play which role, right? And here we have a reusable one, right? When the actor's name change, you put a new slip on, right? And this is an example of a, a, what's called a side. Those of you have seen Midsummer Night's Dream, when the Rue Mechanicals are going to do their play, they get their own scripts that are not complete scripts. Every time that this person stops speaking or singing, there's a mark like that. And then he waits, and he doesn't get a cue. And this is what he's supposed to say later. He's supposed to remember the cues himself. And this is an example of a different kind of text that we only find in the, in the uh, palace, a trento, which has very extensive theater directions in it, stage directions in it. And these are how the actors would stand on stage to make these characters, right? And notice that you've had some people got changed out there, right? And uh, this kind of thing also happened in real life. This is a long scroll of possession. The emperor is coming back from the south. And so this is Tianxia, uh, excuse me, Tianzi Wan, Wan, uh, Wan Yan, uh, long life to the emperor, right? Uh, they also did it in fireworks. This is a script that includes musical notation. Peking opera, they don't have very much musical notation. So this is a chu pai, or a set tune, a fixed tune. Uh, here we have an example that says that when you recopy, get rid of the musical notation. The emperor doesn't care. Uh, here we have, it says, Buyum. It says, they don't want this part. All the way up to here, cut this out. So we can see how plays are changing through the scripts that have survived. Uh, here we have a full play, uh, and this is the story of uh, the fourth son, uh, Salon. And you can see it's been marked up with red for punctuation, some changes from places to place. And it does not stop at the end of a scene, but right in the middle of the scene, you go to the second part. And uh, I screwed this up. But up here, uh, in this script, it gives the actors' names at the front. And so I wanted an example of the Salon play, the fourth son play, but I screwed up. This is a different play, but here we have uh, Zhao Tian, which is the stage name of uh, uh, Tan Xinpei, who I was playing a record of early on, right? And other actors there. That's interesting stuff, too. So in terms of what you get in a script, this is um, for the plays I'm working for in my project, the Shikao plays, this is what it looks like. You've got an introduction, and it starts here, where the main character coming on stage, immediately opens his mouth, 
and does a uh, introductory piece. This is a, trans, a translation quote of the play by uh, A.C. Squat. Not Squat, Scott. <laughs> and then it takes him a page and a half before the person opens his mouth. So he describes everything that's going on on stage, right? Uh, so typically um, scripts are very laconic in terms of stage directions. So what about modern media in the palace collection? Here we have a wax cylinder. For the, uh, the conference in Chicago, Judith Seitlin has tracked down wax cylinders from China from the early um, uh, 1900s, okay? 1902, I think it was, and then a later phonograph, right? And so uh, when they first got phonographs, what did they call them? Oh, uh, where is it? Hmm. Oh, here. Excuse me. Chang Xi Xi Qi. So what is this machine good for, a phonograph? It's for playing opera. Right? And then from that Macau exhibition, they actually had records that were kept in the palace. Okay? And then we could listen to some examples. They also, in the archives, had pictures of actors, right? So since she liked photographs of actors, you can see it looks like these costumes just came out of the trunk. And another, and another, this is Tan Shen Pei himself, the king of actors. And here are some eunuchs performing, and so notice they're just kind of out in the courtyard here with some simple props, and notice that the same pair, right? Perhaps even from the same play, some others, right? Uh, there's an early movie about Empress Dowager so she, where actually she wants to break a camera and it gets given to a eunuch. More on that later. And so people at the time were trying to use modern media, uh, lithographic prints, and so this is a very famous play about an opium addict, and it has an introduction, and this is what the first scene is supposed to look like. And then they decided that folks in the province might want to write the, uh, perform the play, but they hadn't written out the script. It was improvised on stage, so they took photos. So notice this is very similar, right? This is the main character at three different stages. Okay? And so there's a very interesting movie I recommend. It's called Shadow Magic. The Chinese name is Xiang Jing, about the introduction of uh, cinema into China, and they have a scene where Empress Dowager Sushi uh, gets to see uh, Matahari dancing, right? And so on like that. And so that's uh, Tan Shinpei, the guy who uh, was so famous. Okay? And you might know the first person to star in a Chinese film was Tan Shinpei, right? A uh, silent film. Okay? And so, wow! Time for questions. <laughs> okay? Now, we can spend our time at this point. So there's some 300 slides, right? You just saw 300 slides. <laughs> so anyway, we can spend this time question and answer, or I can show you uh, bits. So. Bits. Bits. bits? Bits. OK. I have a bit ready. The one that uh, some of you, this will be old hat. You saw it before. This guy go away. Don't want Caruso, right? So actually, that bit went away. So we'll just do it this way. So this is a Hong Kong movie. And it's the only one that I know of, of a movie. That they use more than one um, level of the theater. Sorry about crudeness here. So this is set in the Shenfeng Emperor's reign, and he's sick. And it's his birthday. They're going to perform a play for him. <laughs> says, things are bad, we can't even celebrate his birthday well. So that's the emperor there with a the white rim. So Shenfeng had to leave Beijing because the troops came in, but he still watched opera in the retirement, right? Spent all his time watching opera.
So that's an upper level. Obviously celestial, right? Auspicious clouds. This is an example of one of those set tunes, a chu pai, dian zhang chun. These are heavenly troops who have been commissioned to capture the Monkey King. That's Li Jing. He has a pagoda in his hand. It's called the uh, Pagoda King Li. He's not feeling too good. So he, he's going to give his command to all the heavenly generals? Yeah. Go capture that evil monkey. They say, okay. We got some little monkey kings. The monkey king can take hairs off his body and turn them into a soldiers. There's the monkey king himself in front. So more complicated face pattern than I showed you in the, print, in the painting before. So they're looking, they're sitting a long way away, right? They should have opera glasses. Sometimes they sit outside and watch. What they said before was sha, meaning go kill. See, so you're not feeling too good? He doesn't want to spoil the party. So, gotta go change, then I'll come back, he says. We're gonna skip ahead because there's something else I want you to see.
Anybody's head hurt? <laughs> so I want it nice and loud, right? Picking opera began outside, right? You want people to know there's something happening. Okay, uh, if we have time, I'll show you some examples from that movie I mentioned, uh, which is Shadow Magic. Again, I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, what we saw, it's, uh, the, the English title is Rain Behind a Curtain, is the name of it. So it's, there we go. And this is from Shadow Magic. This is the Chinese version, so I'm afraid it will not have uh, English subtitles. But the visual should be pretty clear. We have somebody who specializes in film in the audience, so I'm sure is laughing up his sleeve. Oh, he went. Good. He missed it. So here we have the camera coming into the, the, uh, the palace. Uh, the uh, the Westerner is played by Jared Harris. I don't forget. I forget the name that he has in the film itself. So he's uh, not doing too well. He's hoping that he can be successful from getting the attention of the uh, Empress Dowager. Here we have somebody performing uh, as Tan Shinpei, the famous ma actor of male roles, and you can see Sushi watching. He looks kind of like Tan Shinpei. He's obviously not singing at the moment, however. So Sushi says, ooh, that's nice. I like that. I like that. And so this is the real hero of the film, the young guy, right? The owner of the studio, the, the photography studio who did the first film. This is Tension Bay's daughter, who has kind of an interest in the young guy on the right. They eventually get together. So again, the first Chinese film was a film shot of this actor, Tension Bay, not the real life guy. And so here we have what? This is Sushi uh, playing like Guan Yin to get a photo taken, so they included that. And the head of this, the uh, studio is the guy who's moving at the moment. His surname was Ren, I'm, f I'm forgetting his full name at the moment. There she is. It has labels in all the photo uh, photographs. You can tell who is who. At this point, Tai Shinpei, the actor, is very hesitant about new technology. In the process, in this fictional process, he decides to become a film actor as well as a stage actor. So here you're going to have the, uh, the showing. You can begin. Must be a eunuch, right? So I'm going to stay after 1 o'clock, we'll let people go, and anybody has any questions. They have a nice fancy screen, right? So, so she likes that too. They like that. So that's who? Matahari. That's Tan Shinpei out of costume. And it's his daughter. So he's finally kind of impressed. So those foreigners have made some progress. They are good at having fun. 
And so they've come to offer their respects to you. It's all for you. Notice their fingernails have to be protected, right? We'll just skip ahead, show you how things have end. You should go home. So the young fellow opens up his own cinema and he takes pictures of locals, not Matahari and things like that. So they're having a good time. And, and they even have a, these are stage performers, Shangsheng performers, and they're actually in the audience and they dub themselves, right? So there they are. Okay, so it's a fun film. So uh, if you have time, if you have some questions, stay. Those of you who have to run off, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll talk to you guys too.